Well, hello, we're back talking about rolling motion this time. So uh, rolling motion is what happens when an object rolls without slipping, so that the point of contact between the object that's rolling and the ground does not slide. That's the idea. So let's look at the rolling motion of a wheel in slow motion. I, I put a red dot on there so we could follow it. And every time the red dot hits the ground, we're going to take a freeze frame, and then we're going to go back and look. How far did the wheel travel between the two freeze frames? Well, as you can see, since the red dot is at the bottom, the distance traveled has to be nothing other than a circumference. Then the question is, how much did the wheel rotate between the freeze frames? And the answer is it rotated through an angle of 2 pi, one full revolution. And uh, that means we can compute the speed. The speed is going to be the circumference divided by the time it takes to go around once. But I can factor that a little strangely. I'm going to factor the 2 pi and the t out. And notice that 2 pi is the angle that the thing rotated through, and t is the time it took to rotate. So the thing in parentheses there is nothing other than the angular velocity. And so what we have is a very simple relationship between the translational speed of an object that's rolling without slipping along a nice straight path, and the angular velocity of the thing as it turns. So let's look at a demo of that and see how that goes. So here I have a, uh, a disk. It's a solid disk. You can see it's uh, running along a, a flat surface. And uh, if I click here, we'll turn on the time, and you'll see how it goes. Down here, we're graphing the displacement of the disk as a function of time. And uh, it's quite easy. The velocity is constant. The angular velocity is constant. The thing just moves to the right with a constant speed. And uh, the omega and the v are connected by the relationship that v is equal to omega times r. OK, now I want to describe kinetic energy in terms of rolling motion. If I've got an object that's translating and rotating simultaneously, the total kinetic energy is going to be the sum of the translational part that has to do with the motion of the center of mass and the rotational part that has to do with the stuff going around the center of mass. And uh, I often know that the object has a definite geometry, and so I can put in something about the rotational inertia. In the case we're about to study, we're going to be looking at a, at a solid cylinder, and solid cylinders have a rotational inertia of 1 half times the mass times the radius squared. And we just worked out the relationship between omega and the translational velocity, so I can put that in. And substituting all that, I get a kinetic energy that looks hideous, but look, the r's cancel, and you get two terms that both look about the same, a half mv squared and a fourth mv squared. And so if you put all that together, you get the total kinetic energy, including the rotational piece, is 3 fourths mv squared. So let's do an example. Imagine we have a solid cylinder at the top of a hill, and it rolls down the hill. And uh, given that it starts at rest, we want to know how fast it's going at the bottom. So the idea here is to apply the energy principle. The change in the energy of the system is equal to the work done on the system by the surroundings. If we neglect any frictional losses, any deformation of the wheel or anything like that, we can uh, say that the change in the energy of the system is going to be zero. So we're including the wheel and the earth in the system. So we've got kinetic energy and potential energy in general. But if the change in the energy is zero, it means the initial and final energies are going to be equal. And so I can set the zero of potential energy at the bottom of the hill, and that means at the top of the hill we have potential energy. But since the wheel starts at rest, there's no kinetic energy. And at the bottom of the hill, there's no potential energy, because that's where I set the zero of potential energy. But there must be kinetic energy in order for the total energy to be conserved. So I can write down the total energy, rotational plus translational, at the bottom is equal to the potential energy at the top. And if we plug all that in, make the substitutions we just talked about, we can solve for the final speed in terms of the height of the hill. Notice that the mass of the wheel, the radius of the wheel, all cancel out in the end. Let's see what that looks like in a demo with the inclined plane. OK, here's a similar idea, except now I've got a solid disk uh, at the top of a straight inclined plane. 
and I'm going to be graphing energy down here. Let's go ahead and turn the time on, and you can see how it goes. We have here at the top, the cyan is the total energy, the red is the potential energy, and the blue and the green are the translational and the rotational part of the kinetic energy. Notice that the translational and rotational parts of the kinetic energy appear to be linked in some way, and they're basically sharing the loss, the amount of energy that's been uh, lost by the potential energy term. So the, the sum of the three, notice, stays constant. So that's an interesting case, and uh, you'll get to study that a little more in the journal questions. And finally, I want to do another demo just to illustrate the thing that the answer turns out the same, even though the situation is more complicated, on a curved hill. Okay, the last example. Here I have a solid disk on a curved hill, and uh, I'm going to be graphing energy just like before. Let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. The thing comes down the hill. It does a little bit of a whoop, and then it ends. And I want you to notice that qualitatively, it's not very different from the inclined plane. At the end, the kinetic energy of translation and the rotational part have about the same relationship to one another that they did at the end of the inclined plane. But there are some challenge questions in the journal about what's going on in the middle that isn't quite the same. So the short story is the answer turns out the same whether the hill is curved or straight. But the situation in the intermediate uh, time periods is a little more interesting and something to think about if you're interested in a challenge. We'll see you guys next time.